Okay, let's get started. Um, I'm going to begin uh, by discussing some logistics because I'm calling a little bit of an audible on some scheduling, and I'll tell you why. So if you recall, I had told you that um, we were not going to have in-person lecture on Friday, and the reason for that is that in addition to being your statics professor, I'm also the associate dean for the college, and we have our Green and White Day event on Friday, so I kind of need to, uh, to be there for that. Well, in addition to uh, 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 Friday, or in addition to the, 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 uh, the, you know, me missing Friday, I I'm pretty sure I need to miss Monday as well, and, and I'll explain why. Um, so um, every university that has uh, ABET accredited degree programs goes through periodic uh, uh, assessment review. ABET comes uh, to your university and does an ABET visit, you know, uh, regular and in, in regular intervals. And our ABET visit is this year, and it starts on Monday. And um, uh, my dean and I, uh, we're, we're probably going to be tag teaming some events that day uh, in order to ensure that the visit goes smoothly because the visit's being done virtually. You know, you know, you probably guess why. And so I think it makes sense for me to go ahead and just plan that that Monday. Um, uh, I should probably try and do a virtual lecture as well. Um, and, I'll, and I'll tell you why I want to have a lecture as opposed to just canceling class, and you'll understand why. Now, um, Monday was supposed to be our exam review, and I am not a fan of doing a pre-recorded exam review or anything like that. I want you to have the opportunity to ask whatever questions that you want. But if we're not going to be here on Monday and the exam's on Wednesday, that doesn't really leave much uh, time to ask questions. So like I said, I'm calling an audible. This is what I want to do. Um, today, we're going to discuss uh, fixed supports uh, in two dimensions. Um, and then what we're going to do on Wednesday and, and into Friday is we're going to do some 3D problems. I think uh, the next lecture is really the one that's like the most important to understand 3D equilibrium. But because 3D equilibrium problems are just kind of long, I always like to do two lectures on that just with additional examples. So we'll focus our first uh, lecture on just a particular example problem, and then we'll do uh, another example on uh, uh, Friday, and that'll be a pre-recorded lecture. Now, Monday, what we were going to do is Monday was going to be the exam review, Wednesday was going to be the exam, and Friday we were going to start with centroids. I think what I'm going to do is on that Monday, I'm going to record uh, the first Centroids lecture, uh, and I'll assign a homework, but it won't be due till well after the uh, uh, well after the second exam. And so when we come back after the exam, which we'll do on Friday, October 22nd, we'll get rocking and rolling on on Centroids. So my idea is we were going to have the exam on the 20th. I'm just going to move it down to the 22nd. I'm not going to make you take the exam early. I don't think that's right. Uh, but in order to keep us uh, rocking and rolling, I want to um, take the exam and move it one day late. Now, a couple of, uh, or one lecture late. A couple of things worth mentioning. I could just cancel class. I don't want to do that, and there, there's a specific reason why. We're doing really well in terms of, of keeping on track and keeping on point. Um, I think you probably noticed right now, or by now, that I, I try and run a pretty structured course, and I think we've been keeping our, our pace pretty well throughout the semester. If you look at the syllabus, one of the things you'll see is that the Friday before Thanksgiving break, if we're on track and we're rocking and rolling, we'll cancel class the Friday before Thanksgiving break. So it gives you a little bit of time off, unless you're that excited about statics that you want to meet uh, before your week off. Oh, I'm not hearing anybody you know, say anything. Oh, I thought you all liked this class. Huh? I'm joking. It's a, it's a joke. Laugh. It's <laughs> My goodness. Um, Ha, 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 yeah. Um, let, me, let me also talk a little bit about um, homework 4.3. So what we're going to do is I'm going to assign, uh, so you turned in homework 4.1 today. I'm going to assign homework 4.2 uh, that's due Wednesday. I'll go ahead and tell you that homework 4.1 was probably a tad tricky. 4.2 is a breeze compared to that. It is a very short assignment. Uh, but then on Wednesday, I'm going to assign homework 4.3. It's kind of long. So I'm going to give you until Monday to do that. Okay? Instead of it being due right on Friday, I'm going to give you a, a little bit of extra time and have you submit that on, on Monday. Just because 
the 3D equilibrium problems just tend to be kind of long, and, and I don't want to crunch that. And, and, and I figure it's fair to give you a, a little bit more time on that. And then on Monday, we'll start the discussion of centroids. I'll assign homework 5.1, but it will not be due to the following Monday. Okay? It's a really short assignment, but I don't want, I, I don't want you to uh, 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 feel like you, you are pressured to do that for the exam. Centroids will not be on exam two. Okay? Exam two ends with rigid body equilibrium. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? Again, I don't like moving exams like that, but I think given the parameters and given what's going on, I think that's the fairest uh, decision. And I, and I wanted to make sure I was doing it with enough lead time. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? All right. So what we'll do is uh, after, uh, after the second exam, we'll be right back you know, to schedule as usual because on lecture 27, we were supposed to do centroids of composite shapes, and that's what we'll be doing that day. And again, as long as we're rocking and rolling the Friday before Thanksgiving break, we can all uh, we can all take it easy. Sound good? Everybody okay with that? Are there any questions? One one other thing I will mention. So um, I started going through um, uh, scheduling and whatnot for the next couple of weeks, not just in here, but in my other course as well, structural analysis and. Um, one of the things that you might have noticed over the weekend or maybe today is that I had posted a bunch of lecture notes and I have since taken them down. The, the reason I took them down is not because there's anything wrong with them, but they had referenced the original scheduling plan and I called this audible like today. So I, I thought I'll pull them down, get all the scheduling right, and then re-upload them. Okay? My plan also is, and I don't know if I'm going to do this today, maybe it's today, maybe it's tomorrow, but um, I, I had to work out some, uh, some, some scheduling, not just for this class, but for structural analysis. So actually in structural analysis, I uploaded like all these lectures all at once, and my plan is to do the same thing in here. So I might not get that done today. It might be tomorrow or Wednesday. But the idea is that you'll have all of this material uh, within the next little bit. Does that sound like a plan? All right, any questions about scheduling? OK. All right, um, today's lecture is really going to be focused on a particular example problem. Uh, I want to continue the discussion of t uh, rigid body equilibrium in two dimensions. Uh, depending upon where we end, we might introduce the 3D problem that we're going to do on Wednesday just because it's not hard, but the, again, the 3D problems, there's a lot of vector descriptions, a lot of cross products, a lot of just grunt work to actually get to, to where you need to go. And so sometimes it might make sense to just try and chip away at a little bit of that uh, early if you can. So in rigid body equilibrium, remember when we were looking at equivalent systems, um, with equivalent systems, the idea is that the sum of forces and moments in system one equals the sum of forces and moments in system two. With equilibrium, what we're saying is that the sum of the forces and the sum of the moments must be equal to zero respectively. And so what are the external reactions required to maintain equilibrium? Okay. And so part of the lecture that we had last time was all about defining the end conditions that we deal with uh, in engineering modeling. And so we looked at a, a beam last time that had both a uh, pinned support and a roller support. Remember, pinned supports in two dimensions carry with it um, two unknown reactions, an unknown reaction in the x direction and an unknown reaction in the y direction. Uh, y direction. And those two reactions are independent of one another. Um, and then roller reactions carry one unknown in the direction of the roller. Okay? It can be up or down, or if the roller's horizontal, it can be left or right. Uh, but the idea is that it only carries one unknown. Now, today what we're going to do is we're going to look at this problem. Okay? Now, this problem uh, uh, has, you know, we have a frame here. We have 750 newtons applied at A. We have 450 newtons applied uh, at this uh, point, uh, 400 millimeters up from C. Uh, but what makes this problem a little different is what's going on at point C. Okay? This problem has a fixed support. Okay? Now, fixed supports carry with them three unknown reactions. Right? Because whenever you have a fixed support, you carry with it not just a, reaction, a force reaction in the x direction and a force reaction in the y direction, but there is an unknown moment reaction uh, as well. So we're going to have to solve for each of those. One of the nice things, though, about problems like this, and this tends to be the case with problems with fixed supports, is that the order in which you solve the problem is not as important 
to the overall simplicity of your work. In other words, when we did the beam uh, problem last time, we, we got a little strategic about how we did the problem. We said, okay, I want to sum moments at A because two of those unknowns go directly through A and then that isolates that reaction at B and it makes it a little easier to do all of the, the, the plug and chug later, right? You know, ultimately when we're dealing with a, a rigid body equilibrium problem, we're dealing with a simultaneous system of equations, you know, uh, two equations, two unknowns, or three equations, three unknowns, or even in the case of 3D, it might be six equations, six unknowns. But that doesn't mean we can't be strategic about our approach, okay? So I propose that for, um, uh, for this problem, because it's a fixed support, the um, strategy component of your calculations isn't as important because all of the unknowns are located at one point, and so it really doesn't matter what order that you do the problem in, you're going to get the, uh, uh, the same answer. So going into this, let's just make sure we're clear on the problem. We have uh, this T-shaped frame here. We have a wire connecting points B, to, uh, points B and D, and we know that the tensile force in that wire is 1,300 newtons, so I want to determine the reactions at the fixed support C. So let me break out the notebook here. Okay. Oh, I didn't grab my notebook. My handy-dandy notebook. I have a three-year-old. Of course I'm going to reference Blue's Clues. All right. So <clears throat> here's the problem. And what we're going to do uh, first off before we, um, we, before we start um, uh, uh, breaking this down is I, I want to look at uh, BD. I want to look at the geometry here. And this might uh, harken back to some of the stuff that you did for your last homework assignment. So... Hold on. Okay. So let's look at the geometry of the wire. And the reason I'm doing this, you're going to see, is because ultimately I want to use this definition. Okay, I want to use this definition. Okay, I'm going to be kind of formal in the notation, uh, and you'll you'll see why here in a bit. Um, but the more practice that you get with this, you're going to start to be able to uh, resolve these into their individual components without breaking out the IJ notation. And and that's going to be kind of important to go through problems a little faster later on when we start doing things like truss analyses and shear and moment diagrams, etc. Um, at some point, you kind of have to, um, in order to be efficient, you kind of have to dispense with the notation a little bit. Okay, so here's our problem. Uh, I want to look at this, uh, this sort of triangle right here. So, so that you're aware of what I'm looking at, this is the triangle, and this is point B and point D. So I'm sort of looking at like this triangle right here. All right. Um, this dimension here is 600 millimeters, okay? And this dimension here is what? 250. So what is the length of that? How do we do that? There we go. And so what is that? Six fifty. Do I have a second on that? Yeah. All right. So therefore, would you agree that BD is what is it? 250 times I plus negative 600 times J. 
In other words, to get from point D to, or from point B to point D, we go positive on the x-axis, we drop down on the y. Everybody okay with that? Okay, so if that's the case, lambda BD is what? 250 millimeters over 650 plus negative 600 over 650 Hold on, let me make that a little better. And so, in order to, well, I'll leave it like this. Let's just leave it like this. So, I'm going to see if I can do these calculations all at once. All right, this is my distance vector, this is my unit vector, and ultimately I want to do this. What was the tensile force in this table? 1300 newtons. So would you agree then that the tensile force in that cable is just 1300 newtons times 250 over 650 I plus negative 600 over 650 J. Is that fair? Just do it all at once. Just keep, just keep it simple. So help me out with the I term. What's 1,300 times that over that? 500. Okay, what's 1,300 times this over this? 1200. Do I have a second on that? Exactly right. So this is negative 1200 newtons, sorry, newtons, J. At this point, that I hope is straightforward, that that's not complicated. Everybody good? Now, that's not the point of the problem. The point of the problem is to determine the reactions at C, okay? Um, but we, if you look at the problem, okay, we've got a 750 newton force going down. We have a 450 newton force going left. And then we're ultimately going to have a, a force along line BD. So what this does is tell me what are the X and Y components of those, force, those forces or of that force. And that's going to make our math that we do here in a bit a lot easier. Okay? So far so good? So in order to assess this problem, we need to draw a free body diagram. Okay? So let me draw this free body diagram. Let me see if I can clean that up a little bit. All right. So let's draw our free body diagram. Okay, so let's see. Okay, so that scale is all sorts of off, but that's all right. Okay, now what are our applied loads? We have 750 newtons, actually let me put that over here because I know that this dimension here is 500. Okay, um, we have a load here, but watch what I'm going to do. Instead of drawing a load like that, what I'm going to do is represent this load with its X and Y components. 
I'm going to say I have 500 newtons going this way and 1200 newtons going that way. Isn't that statically equivalent? Yeah, right? Remember the tip to tail vector addition that if I take this and go down here, that that's the same magnitude of that load? If you don't believe me, so put the 500 newtons here and the 1200 newtons here, what is the hypotenuse of that triangle? It's 1200 squared plus 500 squared, take the square root. What do you get if you take the square root of those two numbers squared added together? You get 1300, right? That's what the problem said, that the tensile force in that wire was 1300 newtons. Does that make sense? All right. Now, I'm not done because I've got this 450 newton force applied right here. Okay, I can see I'm going to run out a little bit of room over here on the left, and so I'm going to use some cheating technology and slide this over. Okay, so this dimension here, actually, hold on. So we know that this dimension here is 600 millimeters. And we know that this dimension here is 400 millimeters. Did I get that right? I think I got that right, didn't I? Okay. All right. Now we need to deal with what's going on at point C. This is point C, okay? Now, point C is a fixed support, okay? Now, whenever you have a fixed support, there are three unknown reactions, right? Remember, when you have the pin support that's drawn with the triangle, that's two unknown reactions. Whenever you have the roller, that's one unknown. This has three unknowns, okay? So what I'm going to do is identify those three unknown reactions. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say CX goes like that. CY goes like this. So I'm saying, you know, this is acting to the right, this is acting upwards, and as for the moment at C, I kind of draw it like this. I'm saying it goes this way. So I'm saying C acts to the right, C or CX acts to the right, CY acts upwards, and then the moment at C is counterclockwise. Now, some of you are probably maybe looking a little bit into the future and saying, are you sure those are drawn the right way? Maybe they are. Maybe they're not. Who cares? Okay. Here's why. I have assumed some directions. If the math yields a negative answer, that does not mean I need to develop significant emotional distress. All it means is that the assumed direction is incorrect. For example, this CY, I assumed it's upward. If I get a negative answer for CY, that just means it's acting downward. It's okay, okay? Sometimes it's easiest whenever you're doing these problems is to just assume all the reactions act upwards or all the reactions act to the right or all the rea moment reactions act counterclockwise and just let the math figure it out, okay? As you get better at this, you will be able to start looking at the problems and go, okay, that reaction's going down, that reaction's going to the left, et cetera. For now, just let the math work itself out. Everybody good? Yes? Uh, we were doing some stuff like this in the homework. Did you have to correct the directions, the assumed directions, or can we leave them and just make sure that our final answer says like upward or downward? The, the second. Okay, so the question was, um, as you're doing the homework assignment, do you need to go back and correct the free body diagram? In my opinion, the answer to that is no. I'll also make sure the TAs know that. Um, because what matters is at the end you say CX is whatever value in what direction it is. Okay, All this is is the assumption that we're using to track our data. I I'll say this, when I'm computing reactions, I kind of like to just let the values be what they are. Okay, And if I then use these reactions later and draw additional free body diagrams, then I'll correct them. 
which we will do in here later when we start looking at trusses and shear and moment diagrams, et cetera. Okay? That's a fair question. Everybody else okay with that? Okay. Sorry. Whew. My nose is itchy. All right. So let me scroll down a little bit here. So I want some room. Now, the nice thing about uh, fixed supports is that because all of the reactions are, at, are in one spot, um, we can do the, uh, we can solve our equations of equilibrium in whatever order we would like, and it's not really going to uh, affect things from a strategic perspective. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum forces in the x direction first. So let's sum forces in the x direction. And remember, whenever we write this equation, we need to pick a sign convention. So I will pick the uh, forces to the right are positive. There's nothing magic about that. Okay, I could easily pick that forces to the left are positive. It's just me tracking the data. By, uh, ultimately, whenever I write this equation, what I'm saying is all the forces to the right equal all the forces to the left. So this is just a way of mathematically simplifying it for, for me as I, I write it out. Now, whenever you go through this, what you do is just treat it like a checkbox. Go through every force in the system and see if you need to assess it. So let's start off with this force up here, the 750 newtons. Do I need to worry about that right now? No, it, it's vertical. What about the 450? Is it positive or negative? Negative. Okay, let's look at the reaction. Do I need to consider CY? MC. CX. Positive or negative? All right, 1,200 newtons? No, 500 newtons. Positive or negative? Anything else? Nope, right? So the sum of those forces must be zero. All right, so what do we got? We got uh, CX, and then what do we have? We have negative 450 plus 500. I combine those, I get 50. So what is CX? Negative 50 newtons. So what does that mean? I assumed the incorrect direction. It is, in fact, acting to the left. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that, okay? Nothing wrong with that at all. Next, let's sum forces in the y direction, okay? So let's sum forces in the y direction. I'll put this up here. And let's take upward forces to be positive, okay? So, just do the same thing. Do I consider this 750? Yes. Positive or negative? Negative. All right, what about this 450? Nope. What about CY? Yep. Positive or negative? All right. What about the MC? Nope. What about the CX? Nope. What about the 500? 1,200? Oh, yeah. And 1,200 is negative, right? Just be systematic about it. That's all there is to it. Okay? So, what do we got? Okay, so negative 750, negative 1,200. I can combine those and say CY minus 1950 newtons equals zero. So therefore, CY is positive 1950 newtons. Did I get that right? Well, there you go. So all that means is that I assumed the correct direction for CY, right? That's all that means, okay? All right. I'm going to do a little bit more magic here uh, on my screen. So I'm going to move this down. I'm going to move this up. Yeah, you can't do this on a whiteboard. All 
Okay, I, I'll admit I'm getting kind of spoiled to being able to do stuff like this. Boom. Okay, and the reason I wanted to do that is because I wanted to be able to sum moments down here. And I wanted to be able to still see the free body diagram. I didn't want to have to scroll up and down. So we're going to sum moments now. And whenever we sum moments, the first thing that we need to do is we need to identify a point about which to sum moments. Now here's the thing. The structure doesn't care, okay? The reactions are what the reactions are. And the problem doesn't care where you sum moments. The answer is the answer, okay? But that doesn't mean we have to make the problem or make the math hard on us, okay? So I propose that we should be picking the point about which the most forces intersect, okay? Why? Because if I have a particle and I have a force going through that particle, how much moment is generated by that force? Zero, okay? So I propose that we should sum moments at C, okay? Because this force and this force will intersect. Another potential location would be this force, this point right here. I could sum moments there. I've got two forces that go through uh, the, the point there. You'll get the same answer. It will not change, okay? And if you don't believe me, you should try it. You should see. All right, so we're going to sum moments at C. And we're going to take counterclockwise moments to be positive. So let's see what we get, okay? So let's take it one step at a time. So we do the same thing. Let's, let's see if we can do it in the same order. So, we're, so remember, whenever you're summing moments, you keep your eye fixed on this point as you check off your boxes. Let's start off with the 750 newtons here on the top. Does that generate a moment about point C? Yes. If I'm point C and that's that 750 newtons, it is wanting to spin or rotate point C, right? Is that generating a positive moment or a negative moment according to our sign convention? Positive, exactly. And now what is the moment arm? Remember the moment arm is the shortest distance from the line of action of this 750 newtons, so that line of action to C. What is the shortest distance from that line of action to point C? 500. So what do we have? We have positive 750 newtons, I'll put positive there, times 500 millimeters. There's the moment contribution by that force. What about the 450? Does the 450 generate moment about point C? Yes. All right. Is it wanting to ro uh, rotate a point C in a positive direction or a negative direction? Positive. All right. What is the moment arm? The shortest distance from the line of action of this force to point C? 400 millimeters. That dimension right there. It's exactly right. So plus 450 times 500 or times 400. 450. All right. Do we consider CX? No. It's going through point C. It is not generating moment about point C. What about CY? Do we consider CY? All right. Now, what about MC? Yeah, MC is wanting to rotate point C, all right? Now, is it positive or negative? Positive. Now, here, here's the trick question. What's the moment arm? Well, here, it's a trick question because there isn't one, right? Moments are defined as forces times moment arms, but this is a moment vector in and of itself. There is no moment arm, right? So you just add it, right? It is a moment by itself. So you don't say it's MC times something. It's just MC, okay? Sort of a trick question, I know. But I just want you to sort of think through that, that it is a moment already, right? We're summing moments. So some, like 750 newtons, that's not a moment. 750 newtons times that, that's a moment. That's a moment, and that's a moment. So it doesn't need to be multiplied by anything. Make sense? Now, 1,200 newtons, is that generating moment about point C? 
So 1,200 Newtons, yes. In what direction, positive or negative? Negative. negative. And what's its moment arm? <sighs> I didn't put the dimension. I'm sorry. What's the moment arm? What's the moment arm for this 1,200 Newtons now? Uh, yeah. Man, wish I had that on there. Whoops. So negative 1,200 Newtons times 150 millimeters. Finally, we have the 500 Newtons. Is the 500 Newtons generating moment about point C? Yes. Okay. Um, positive or negative rotation? Negative times a moment arm of? 600 millimeters, exactly right. So five, so negative 500 newtons times 600 millimeters. And all this, all right, I'm going to cheat again. All this equals zero. And how many unknowns are in this expression? One, just MC, right? That's kind of one of the reasons I like fixed supports is that for every one of those uh, uh, summations, there was only one unknown in each of them. Only one unknown in the x direction, only one unknown in the y, only one unknown uh, uh, for moments. So at this point, I'm going to scroll down a little bit. At this point, this kind of just becomes a little bit of grunt work. So 750 times 500, what is that? It's, it's a big number. These are going to be big numbers because they're newtons times millimeters. So it's a big, sort of a big force times a, you know, a small increment of distance. So yeah, it's going to be kind of big. So what's 750 times 500? 375,000. All right, plus 450 times 400. I think that's what, 180? plus MC minus, okay, 1,200 times 150. I think that's 180, right? Minus, and then 500 times 600, I think that one's, um, what is that, 300,000? I think I can do that one in my head. And now this just sort of becomes an, uh, like an arithmetic or an algebra problem. I, I see a plus 180 and a minus 180. So I got 375 minus 300. So MC, MC plus 75,000 Newton millimeters equals zero. So therefore, MC is negative 75,000. Now, what I'm going to do is this, okay? It's negative, so what is the correct direction? We assumed it was counterclockwise, right? So what is its actual direction? Clockwise, right? So I'm going to say that this is a clockwise moment. And what I'm going to do is if this is 75,000 Newton millimeters, it's the same thing as saying uh, 75, um, or here, let me, let me just sort of be consistent with it. It's basically uh, 75 Newton meters, okay? So to summarize the answer for this problem, CX is, now CX was negative, so it's 50 Newtons to the left, CY was uh, 1,950 Newtons, and it was positive, so it goes up, and then MC, uh, I'm going to say is 75 Newton meters, and it's clockwise, and so that's your answer.
All right. That's not too bad, is it? Hopefully. I can tell you, if you understand this, the, the, I, I'm telling you, this homework is really short. The last homework was a little longer and maybe a bit trickier. This one's simple. Like, it, it's pretty easy. All right, I'm going to stop for a sec, though, and see if anybody has any questions about this. That's a great question. Let's look at that. So the question, are you talking about on the 500? Yeah, on the 500. Okay. So the question was, why did you use, why did I use 600? Because when I'm looking at um, this force right here, okay, the question is this. Here's the line of action, right? That dotted line. You see that little dotted line I drew? Yeah. Okay. And the question is, what is the distance from that line of action to point C, right? So... Here's point C, right? I could use this distance. I could use this distance. But really what I'm after is the shortest distance. And the shortest distance from that line of action to that point is 600. Does that make sense? Yeah, I just got confused with the 750 acting on the opposite direction. Yeah, no, that, that's, that, that's completely reasonable. Uh, and and the, the thing is, the 750, if it was horizontal, It'd, it'd be 600. Let me get rid of those. Wait, hold on. Come on. There you go. All right. Now that, those are very. That's a very reasonable question. Any other questions? All right. I want to introduce the problem on Wednesday. I, I know we're not going to have time to get much, uh, much in the way of doing it, but I want to at least introduce it. So what we're ultimately going to do on Wednesday is attack this problem right here. So this is going to be a 3D equilibrium problem, and it's not hard. It's just long. That's really the only issue. So the idea here is um, we have this sign this sign here that uh, is being supported by two cables. So there's a cable EC and this cable BD, okay? Uh, and it's also being supported by this hinge, this pinned support at A, okay? So we have a pinned support at A, and we have these two cables. And the idea is to determine the tension force in each of the cables as well as the... Um, the tensile force in each of the cables as well as the reaction at A. So from a uh, vector standpoint, what we're going to do is we're going to try and determine the reaction at A. And the reaction at A, since this is a pin support, is a force in the x direction, a force in the y direction, and a force in the z direction. So basically, I'm going to be trying to figure out this. Okay, and I'm also going to try and figure out the tension in cable BD and the tension in cable CE. So it's going to be a lot of vectors, a lot of cross products. Did everybody see the post I made on Teams uh, with the, the links to how to do cross products um, in various calculators? I don't know if, if you all saw that. I posted uh, a series of videos. It's like if you don't have a Casio or something like that, it'll show you how to do the cross product. It's worth looking at especially with problems like this, because we're just going to be chugging a lot of cross products. It's just, it's not hard. It's just, you know that they're labor intensive, and I don't want that to be the, uh, the holdup. Sound good? You get out four minutes early. That's all I got. I'll see you all on Wednesday. <laughs>